There's a lighthouse on a hillside that overlooks life's sea. And when I am tossed about, it sends out a light that I might see. <laughs> Okay, well, we're here at uh, uh, the Med Church in Houston, Texas, uh, having a Bible class. We normally would be doing uh, 1 Timothy, about chapter 5, but we're going to postpone that for uh, this morning. And since this is uh, uh, the proper Sunday, uh, we will start uh, trying to understand the crucifixion. Uh, when that happened and uh, uh, when the resurrection happened. Uh, before we get started in our Bible study, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, remember, confess silently all known sin since you last made that confession. And remember, confession just means that you tell God you did this and that it in your opinion, you agree with him that it was a sin. <clears throat> Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning thankful for your provisions for us. Thankful for your word and thankful for this place we can come together and study your word. We ask that you help us understand it and apply it to our lives. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, so we are going to start out with the crucifixion, get some information about that. Uh, three passages in the New Testament tell us that Jesus was resurrected on Sunday morning. Uh, one of the main ones, Matthew chapter 28. Uh, verse 1. Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary came to see the tomb. Uh, we also have similar verses in Luke chapter 24, verse 1, and John chapter 20, verse 1. But let's look at Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. To begin with, that word Sabbath, sabbaton, is a plural. Uh, it's a, a genitive, neuter, plural noun. So we're talking about more than one Sabbath. So after the Sabbaths, and continuing with that, we say at the dawning of towards one of the Sabbaths. And that word is also plural. So we're talking about uh, two Sabbaths minimum have passed just recently and we're going towards another Sabbath. Alright, so from there to find out when he was crucified, this is the main information we have. Is, uh, is that particular verse. And to find out when he was crucified, we have to start there and go back because that's where most of our information is. So now I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now there's no miracle that we have listed in Scripture that has come under more scrutiny than this 
prophecy and this miracle. Uh, it is unbelieved by so many people, and they consider it a myth. But consider the fact that it's Jesus that's referring to this miracle, and when he does that, he also includes the men of Nineveh. Next verse. The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. So not only does he refer to it, he puts himself into that. And he includes a real city and the men of that city. Next verse. The queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed a greater than Solomon is here. So Jesus not only includes Nineveh and the men of Nineveh and compares himself with the greater than, than Jonah, he also includes the queen of the south and he includes Solomon and he says a greater than Solomon was here. So there's no question about the fact that this was a miracle and that it really did happen. Now back to what really did happen. Verse 40, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth, in the heart of the earth. Oh, so we have that. Okay, now we have some problems. Uh, number one problem is that at this time, uh, the Jews uh, had a 360-day year. Twelve months, but 360 days in the year, approximately. Uh, every sixth year, they added a second twelfth month, the twelfth month of Adar. So every six years, they would have second Adar to make up the days because their calendar was uh, based on the moon and uh, ours, of course, is based on the sun. And every four years, we have to add a day uh, to make that up. Every six years, they had to add a whole another month. So we have a 360-day year. We have days... Uh, two different ways of recording the day during that time. Uh, the Gentiles do it the exact at this time, did it the same way we do. They started at midnight in the middle of the night. Uh, they had the first part of the night, then they had the whole day, and then they had the second part of the night and stopped it just like we do from midnight to midnight. The Jews, however, did it differently. They started when night started, well, approximately 6 p.m., they had the whole night, and then they had the whole day, and then when the night began to start again, that was the end of that day. So we have, what we're going with is from 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. was one day. And that's what Matthew is based on here. 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. one day. If you, we, we also have a recording uh, of this in Gentile time uh, based on 1 Corinthians uh, but we're just going to deal with uh, we're just going to deal with the Jewish time uh, this morning because that's going to be complicated enough okay so we have a 360 day year we have 12 months in the year uh, we have three days involved in the week we have the same week seven day week, three days in the week, and we have two different ways of recording that time. Now, so we know that Christ was out of the tomb Sunday. Okay? So, let's start here with what this day is, would be Saturday. This would be Friday. This would be Thursday. This would be Wednesday. And this would be Tuesday. Alright? So here, 
at 6 p.m. after 6 p.m. on Saturday, Christ is out of the tomb. All right? So let's go. And down here we're going to have uh, the first the first day, uh, night and the first day, the second night, the second day, the third night, and the third day, and then 6 p.m. on Saturday, Sunday starts, right? Okay. So, we know from, th this is the main information we need. Three days and three nights, because I believe what Christ said is that it's going to be just like Jonah. So, we know that Christ could not have been crucified after Wednesday. All right? Now, another thing. Uh, Christ had to be crucified on Passover. All right? And we know when Passover was. Passover was exactly the same day of the year every year. The same day of the year every year. Passover was the 14th of Nisan. Every year. Alright? And so now we've got a 360 day year and a 7 day week. And remember that the only day of the week that's named in Scripture is the Sabbath. And everything is related to that. It's either before or after the Sabbath. We don't have Monday through Saturday. That's not named. I mean, uh, Sunday, Sunday through uh, Friday. Th those are not named. Only the Sabbath is named. Alright, so we have the 14th of Nisan is Passover. So Christ participated in the last meal on the Sabbath after sundown. When He went out after sundown on the Sabbath, He went to the Mount of Olives. There He was arrested. Okay? There He was arrested. And from there, we have We have six trials, all six of which were illegal, but we'll get to that later. So we've got, we've got Wednesday, he was crucified, he was crucified at about um, noon on Wednesday, uh, maybe, maybe earlier than that. He died around 3 p.m. on Wednesday, and he was in the grave prior to 6 p.m. on Thursday. He had to be in the grave before sundown. That was a big deal because this was Passover. And all of these people wanted to participate in Passover. Alright, another thing. Passover was a high holy day. It was a Sabbath. Passover was a Sabbath. It was a high holy day. Now the next day, the next day was also, what was it? It was unleavened bread. This was a, this was a festival. There was a seven day festival. The first day of the festival was a high holy day. It was a Sabbath. And the last day of the festival was a high holy day. It was also a Sabbath. So just so uh, you won't think I've gone crazy, uh, turn to Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus chapter 23. Uh, the first three verses of Leviticus chapter 23 separates the days, uh, separates the weekly Sabbath from the rest of these festivals. So, Leviticus chapter 23 verse 1, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and say to them, the feasts of the Lord which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, 
a holy convocation. You shall do no work on it. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all of your dwellings. So that those three verses separate out the weekly Sabbath, Saturday. All right. Verse four. These are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. On the fourteenth day of the first month at twilight, sundown, is the Lord's Passover. So even though we're dealing with a seven day week, we're also dealing with a 360 day year and the Lord specifies the 14th of Nisan, first day of the year. So that has to happen every year. So it could be on Sabbath, it could be on any one of the other days. It has to happen on the 14th of Nisan. That's Passover. All right. Next verse. And on the 14th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, verse 6. On the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So this is the 15th of Nisan. So we have two days specified in Scripture in about 1450 B.C. is when this was written, approximately that that these particular dates, not days, dates of the year were... Of the year, or the fir first month. Is that oh, January? No. The no. It's, we're talking about the first month of the Jewish year, Nisan. Oh. It, the way that re relates to us is... is uh, uh, March and April. March and April. I'm going to pass out a handout in a minute, but... Uh, and it it has April on it, but it, it's just so it can be named. But the way it figured in is uh, some of it was uh, March and some of it was April. Almost every year, and then every six years, it scheduled back, you know, and got level again. Mm -hmm. So we have the, the first day of first fourteenth day of Nissan, fifteenth day of Nissan, sixteenth day of Nissan, seventeenth day of all of those are dates. Okay, but the only day that we have named is the Sabbath. All right. So uh, let's see. The sign. Okay, the only possible result could be uh, that uh, Christ was crucified on Wednesday, not Friday. No way you can figure this that he's crucified any other day other than Wednesday, and he was put in the tomb before sundown on Wednesday night. Because remember, at sundown, it was going to be Thursday uh, on the Jewish calendar. Uh, so, so we've got the two, we've got the two timetables uh, on the days. Uh, one is from 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. And, the, and the, uh, the Gentile time, which we get in into uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, is scheduled the same way we do. It works out the same way either way. Uh, Miraculously, as that is, okay. So, question. I'm a little slow this morning. You said that the 14th of Nisan would not be on the same day. Not on the same day every year. But yet, if you divide uh, 12 into 360, you get 30 days each month. Therefore. Why wouldn't it be on the same day every year? Because the days are seven. No, you know, it doesn't have anything. Okay. The it days are twenty-eight versus thirty. Yeah, the days are seven. Uh, so it's gonna it's gonna be different every year. It. I mean, after a few years, it's gonna it's gonna come back to the same one. Well, of course. I think ours is ever. But seventh it's, year the same. It's. But it's uh, so it so this even though it was written 1,400 years before Christ actually went through this, uh, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about a seven-day week with only one day of the week named, and a three 30-day month or approximately 30 days. Uh, I think some of them are 29, uh, and and then we have a Jewish calendar here that that. Uh, 
uh, will show you that some of the days, some of the months were 29, some of them were 30, uh, but it was on a 360 day year. Okay. Uh, so we have other we have other feasts. We have uh, uh, the feast of first fruits um, in there. Most of the commentaries uh, will tell you that the feast of first fruits was was on the uh, uh, the sixteenth day of Nisan. Uh, there's one or two that say it was uh, on the uh, the day after the Sabbath, uh, which uh, you know we have that those actual words but uh, and it is a, the Sabbath on and that recording is a singular word uh, but if we if we say that this was a, that it, this was a Sabbath then it could be right here so uh, but that doesn't matter what matters is that we have three full days we have a specified date for two of them and then we have uh, Christ coming out of the coming out of the grave uh, before the, the women got there. Okay, so they're showing up. They're showing up on Sunday as the sun's coming up, remember? Early in the morning, just before the sun comes up. So according to this timetable, we're talking about the middle of the day because the first part of the day was 6 p.m. on Saturday. And so we had to go through through to midnight and then on towards 6 a.m. before the sun starts coming up. So somewhere between midnight and 6 a.m. Uh, the women are showing up at the tomb because it's still dark. Okay, so we got that schedule. Now, uh, any questions about when Christ was crucified and why we think it was uh, on Wednesday not on Friday, and the reason that I particularly am uh, uh, staunch about this is because if we believe what I was taught all of my life, if I believe that, then I have to discount Jonah, the entire book of Jonah, and I have to discount Christ saying what he was going to do. So I have to subconsciously or overtly consciously say well scripture's wrong right there he really wasn't in the ground three days and three nights he was in the ground a part of one day all of another day and a part of another day and that's not what scripture says so that's not what happened all right so now let's let's start out with him walking out of the uh, upper room going to the um, Mount of Olives and being arrested there and after he was arrested there he was taken to his first trial his first trial was on we'll read about that in John chapter 18 John chapter 18 verse 12 you go faster then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. And they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest. So that tells you right then that this is an illegal thing, totally illegal. Annas didn't have anything to do with the court system, but he did have a lot to do uh, with what was going on in Jerusalem because he was the former high priest and at this particular time uh, we have information to indicate that he was the political boss of Jerusalem. No, uh, none of the gangster activity uh, happened in the entire area that wasn't cleared by Annas. He was in charge of all of it. He was also connected with the bands of robbers in the Negev uh, who owed their protection to him. So he was in charge of every, nothing went to the high priest Caiaphas until first it went through Annas. So we, had, we have this political boss totally without any authority uh, that Jesus is before the first time. 
so, so obviously uh, this was illegal from the beginning. Uh, so now we are, uh, uh, remember, let's see now, Chi he's the father-in-law of Caiaphas. Now remember, Caiaphas is the one who advised the, G the Jews that it would be better for us to kill one guy and have one guy die than Rome to come down here and take over the whole area. And that's in uh, verse 14 of chapter 18. Now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. That's what he was talking about. So, so, now, so after we go through Annas, Annas declares him guilty. They, they send him to Caiaphas. Uh, Caiaphas, uh, let's, let's go to, uh, uh, well, just uh, we can stay in John chapter 18 and go to verse 24. Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. We'll get a better understanding if we'll turn back to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, starting at verse 57. And those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed at a distance to the high priest's courtyard, and he went in and sat with the servants to see the end. So we have him at, him at uh, Caiaphas now. Uh, however, he had already been declared guilty by the father-in-law, so they were not there to try to find out if he was guilty or innocent. They were there to find, find out if they could uh, have a justified way of killing him. So remember, he, he's the one that uh, uh, started out wanting to find a reason uh, to have Jesus executed. Now, why was this one illegal, even though the, he was the true high priest? So he, was, he had the authority to do this, okay? But it was illegal because it was still dark. It was still at night. Uh, it was illegal because Jesus had no assigned defense attorney. That's in Jewish law. He had to have a defense attorney. It was illegal because the court actually is stated as seeking false witnesses. And it was illegal because there, were, there was violence in the courtroom initiated by the court. So uh, all of that was uh, another reason why that also was illegal. Not one aspect of this trial conformed to Jewish law, even though this guy was in charge of Jewish law. Uh, only two witnesses were needed. That's in Deuteronomy 19, verse 15. Many came forward bef before uh, this court uh, at night. Many came forward, but they could not get their lives together. Finally, they had to agree uh, on a statement that Jesus had actually made in reference to rebuilding the temple, but uh, if, you'll go, if you'll go to Mark chapter 14, verse 59, Mark tells us that these two didn't even completely agree. Uh, so they didn't have any witnesses uh, that matched up. Though all the lies, Jesus didn't respond to anybody. He put his, the entire matter into the Father's hand, uh, which uh, was remarkable. So then Caiaphas, the high priest, demanded in the name of the living God, imagine that, Caiaphas, a high priest, demanding in the name of the living God that Jesus say if he was the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus says, Su epos, thou sayest. Now that didn't mean a whole lot uh, to uh, a lot of the people there, but it meant a lot to Caiaphas, and it meant a lot to the Jews. Because what he was saying, uh, uh, thou sayest. This is actually a very strong affirmative idiomatic expression. You have said this. Now the judge goes crazy and declares that there are no more witnesses needed because Jesus has committed blasphemy. Okay? Also in the Jewish law, in their Jewish prudence, no one can condemn himself by his own statement apart from a confession of guilty. Now think about that. 
no one can condemn himself by his own statement apart from a confession of guilt. Okay? If he confessed to be guilty of a crime, that he could be condemned for that. All right. What, what Jesus has said is, you have said so. Yes. If Jesus' statement was not true, if it was not true, then it would be thrown out altogether. And they were thinking it was not true. But, so if it's not true, then it's not, it's not even recorded in Scripture or in the court. If it were true, it's not blasphemy. So Jesus did not make a confession of guilt. What he did was make a clear statement of fact that everybody there thought was not true. So there's no way they could use that to condemn him. Uh, so Caiaphas took a clear statement of fact which in reality did not condemn Jesus and said it was a confession which it was not. So there wasn't anything about this first trial in front of Caiaphas that was uh, legal. So now the, now the, uh, the violence begins. They're still in the Sanhedrin. It's still nighttime. And they start slapping him and beating him uh, with their fists. Uh, you turn to Isaiah. Well, you don't need to turn to it. But in Isaiah chapter 52, verse 14, uh, depicts this scene, uh, prophesies this scene. And what it says there was that uh, his, visit, his visage was so marred that you could not tell he was human. So he was beat up a lot uh, here in this court. So when they were through with him, uh, this is the second trial, Jesus no longer looked human. Uh, Isaiah 53, 5, Isaiah saw Jesus on the cross as one massive bruise. 1 Peter chapter 2 uh, verse 24, Peter uh, just remark, just saw Jesus as totally bruised up. Stripes and bruises and marks of blows. Uh, and just keep in mind, if he had responded to any of this, which he could have, uh, there would not be any salvation for us. So now we've been through two illegal trials. We're going to go through a third illegal trial. Third illegal trial is before the same people. It's before the same Sanhedrin. It's before the same officers. It's before the same judge, Caiaphas. But this time, they wait until it's daylight. So now it's at least legal because they can't meet during the nighttime. So uh, the trial was held early the next morning, still by the Jews. They are trying to make this legal by waiting. They ask the same basic questions. Jesus gives them the same answer. So the other problem for the Sanhedrin, it was a feast day. It was feast period. Uh, so the sun's up, okay? The sun's up on Wednesday. See, he, went, he was arrested at night. Now, they, now we get to the sun coming up, and they have the trial again. All of this is in the six trials uh, during the same day. Um, but this is a feast day. And they could not sentence someone to death. Uh, well, they couldn't sentence someone at all on a holy day. And they did not have the authority to sentence uh, anybody to death on any day. The Romans hadn't given them that authority. So after they go through the third trial, uh, which is the same thing as the second trial, only this time it's during the daytime, uh, they say, well, let's pass him off to the Romans. So now we go to the fourth trial, uh, Matthew chapter 27, verse 2. Matthew chapter 27, verse 2. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. So now he's in front of the governor, and it's during the daytime. Uh, this was the day the memorial supper would be eaten. So here we are on Passover day, and this is... It's daytime now, and the memorial supper was, was to be eaten during this day. Uh, they wanted to keep their hands clean in order to eat this memorial supper, 
the Passover which spoke of Christ's death on the cross uh, is, is what they wanted to participate in even though they were there uh, trying to kill Christ because they didn't believe, believe that that's who he was. So Pilate asked, what is the accusation? Well, that gave the Jews a real problem when he asked, what is the accusation that you, are, that you make against this guy? They couldn't say it was blasphemy because Caesar worship was what was going to be the, the judging factor there. And if they said that it was blasphemy because this guy claims to be uh, uh, the son of God, then they would be admitting that they don't think Caesar uh, is God. So they couldn't say blasphemy. So they make up lies. Uh, they come up with some stupid statement saying, if he wasn't guilty, then we wouldn't have brought him to you. That, you know, uh, how, how that sounds. Uh, so they start making up lies after this accusation. Uh, and they can't, uh, they can't get anything uh, uh, to anybody to agree. Blasphemy is not mentioned because Rome had only one type of worship, and that was Caesar worship. So they finally get around to uh, insurrection, and they kind of come to that uh, backwards. Uh, Pilate remained calm and ended up receiving a complete witness from Jesus. We don't find out about that until Paul writes Timothy in his first letter, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 13. Uh, he tells us that Pilate received uh, a good uh, uh, information from the Lord Jesus. Pilate, as it turns out, is the only one who gave Jesus an honest, objective hearing and a cross-examination, even though he still didn't have a defense attorney present to represent him. Uh, he had, uh, Pilate had the discernment to determine that Jesus was innocent, but he did not have the character to free him. He was, he was afraid of the people to free him. So there was no charge. There was no law uh, broken, and there was no defense attorney. So this also was an illegal trial. <clears throat> Fifth trial. So uh, Pilate heard that Herod was in town, so uh, Luke chapter 23, verses 6 through 7, tells us that uh, they sent him over uh, to Herod. Luke chapter 23, verse 6. When Pilate heard of uh, uh, Galilee, he asked if the man were a Galilean. And as soon as he knew that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. So now Pilate sends him over to Herod. Herod was excited to see Jesus. He was, he was anxious to see a miracle, and that was all he was interested in. Uh, he was hoping for some entertainment. Uh, when Jesus wouldn't even answer him, that kind of upset him, and so he uh, disparaged him a little bit and made light of him and made fun of him and sent him back to Pilate. So uh, that also was a, was a no-account trial. Uh, Herod had the authority to have Jesus killed, uh, but he did not, uh, and he also had the authority to free him. And he didn't do either one of those things. So in the sixth trial, we get back to Matthew chapter 27, and we're now in verses 15 uh, through 26. Matthew 27, 15 through 26. Now, Matthew chapter 27. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished, uh, whom the people wanted to be released. Pilate had already said that Jesus was innocent. Uh, now he uses the local custom to placate the Jews in Passover and release Jesus. Uh, and get himself off the hook, get the mob calmed down. Uh, they wanted Barabbas instead. Uh, so Pilate scourged him, uh, beat him, also illegal, 
uh, the, and the soldiers kept punching uh, violence in the court. Uh, and then uh, Pilate one, one made one last attempt to release him after he had beaten him, after he had scourged him. He came out and he said, Behold the man. John chapter 19, verse 5. Behold the man. Well, that didn't mean a whole lot to Pilate. He was just saying, look, here's the guy. But he used those words, behold the man. And if the Jews knew the book of Zechariah, and they knew chapter 6, verse 12, indicates that that statement is about the Messiah. Pilate didn't know it, but the Jews he was talking to knew it, and they went crazy. Uh, and Pilate uh, it didn't know how, how that was going to affect him. And so uh, there was no way he was going to be able to release him at that point. So Pilate was saying, I've examined him and scourged him. Don't you think that's enough? And the Jews wanted him crucified. Pilate again declared him innocent. Pilate wanted to release him, Acts chapter 3, verse 13. The Holy Spirit recorded that Pilate wanted to release him, but his wife talked him out of it. Told him to, didn't talk him out of it, told him to not have anything to do with this man, and he still couldn't do it. Uh, so now the Jews bring up the idea of blasphemy, but not the word of blasphemy in John chapter 19, verses 7 through 9. He said that he was the Son of God. If he did say this, it was insurrection against Caesar. So Pilate questioned him again. Uh, he didn't answer him. Jesus didn't answer him. Uh, he did correct Pilate, though, uh, on Pi the origin. Pilate was asking him about his origin, and he didn't answer that. But he did correct Pilate on Pilate's origin, saying that his authority uh, came from above. Uh, if it wasn't for that, he wouldn't be there. So um, then we have Pilate. Uh, you know the rest of it. We, uh, going ahead and sentencing him, him to death. So we have Jesus crucified on Wednesday, put in the ground, in the, in the grave, on, uh, at, right at sundown on Wednesday night, which would begin Thursday. Stayed there until 6 p.m. on Saturday. After 6 p.m. on Saturday, and before 12 midnight on Sunday, he was out of the tomb. Any questions? Yes. Why then do we celebrate Good Friday on a Friday and then Easter on Sunday, which is only 48 hours in the grave? You have an answer for me, huh? Thank no, you. I do not have an answer for that. <laughs> well, we uh, handed this out. I thought, there's your answer. That, uh, <laughs> that is... Uh, I do not know when that started. Uh, I, I assume uh, that it is as a result of uh, uh, what is it? John chapter 20. John chapter 20. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone was taken away. Uh, so we know from that that it's, uh, uh, that, it's that Jesus uh, was out of the tomb before sunup on Sunday. Uh, and I can't explain. I've tried, but I cannot come up with a reason I'm sure it has to do has something to do with history, and I'm sure it has something to do with the pagan religions of the day uh, that that Christianity was incorporating into Christianity. Uh, but I don't, I can't explain it. Uh, the only the only way they can do it is just say, well, three days and three nights doesn't mean that. And I was raised in the Baptist church, and I had more than one Baptist preacher answer me the same way because I was asking this question and and they would always say any part of the day was considered a day 
Uh, so um, half of a day and an all, whole, all whole day and half of an, another day was fine. Uh, and it, it uh, uh, and I went along with that for the longest uh, until I, uh, I was able to uh, uh, sit under a, a preacher that actually knew what he was talking about. <laughs> Any other questions? So, uh, I think it's about time we can close this down if we have no more questions. Okay. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the information that you have provided for us. We thank you for your word. We thank you for Christ and what he has done and what we have just studied. We ask that you help us understand that and apply it to our lives. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.